Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. The human being as God's mirror. The human being as the sacred ground for God's self-knowing. The human being as the embodiment of the divine names. These ideas had been circulating in the Islamic world for several centuries before Ibn Arabi's birth. We encounter them in the seemingly blasphemous words of Mansur al-Halaj, in the godly identity of Attar's 30 birds, and in the reflected lights of Najmuddin Kubra's spiritual photisms. Variations on the doctrine of the human being serving as an instrument of God's self-knowing can be found in the spiritual literature of several of the world's religions. Yet it would not be unfair to say that Ibn Arabi's teachings about humanity's instrumental role in God's self-knowing are far more inclusive of the diversity of human experience than anything previously written. Even the Sheikh's spiritual heirs appear hesitant to embrace the far-reaching implications of his ideas. What makes Ibn Arabi's message so relevant to our lives is precisely his insistence that all of human experience is divine self-expression. Ibn Arabi emphasized that God's presence can be witnessed anywhere along the continuum of human experience, in the body, in thought, in the imagination, and in various states of enhanced awareness. Historically, many of the spiritual traditions of the world have taught that enlightenment, or knowing God, is only attained by completely transcending the experiences of the senses, the imagination, and thought. Dualistic traditions have described the world as fundamentally unreal, a mirage unrelated to true reality. A recurring theme in Ibn Arabi's writings is the importance of knowing the divine reality as both transcendent and imminent. He taught that spiritual maturity lies in the integration of both perspectives. Witnessing God's transcendence by detaching from the senses and experiencing God's presence in the body and the mind. He states this plainly enough in the opening chapter of the Fusus al Hikam. And I'll be using Austin's translation throughout for the sake of simplicity and access. Quote The reality has described himself as being the outer and the inner the manifest and unmanifest. He brought the cosmos into being as constituting an unseen realm and a sensory realm so that we might perceive the inner through our unseen and the outer through our sensory aspect, unquote. As Zahir the manifest and al batin the unmanifest, are two of God's names. Lists of the divine names, usually numbering 99, are drawn from God's self-described qualities in the Quran. The divine names span the poles of tanzi, transcendence, and tashbi, comparability and imminence. Ibn Arabi's masterpiece, the Fusus al-Hikam, opens with a statement about the human being's comprehensive capacity to reflect all of the divine names. He writes that Adam is called human, insan, because of the universality of his formation and because he embraces all of the realities. The realities that the Sheikh is referring to are the potentials of the divine names. In his opening lines, he describes the human capacity to reflect God's own comprehensiveness. 
quote, the reality wanted to see the essences of his most beautiful names. Or to put it another way, to see his own essence in an all-inclusive object encompassing the whole command, which qualified by existence would reveal to him his own mystery, unquote. In this opening statement, Ibn Arabi captures our essential relationship to God and the instrumental role of our existence in God's self-knowing. He goes on to explain that the angels rejected Adam because they were limited to glorifying God's transcendence. It was their ignorance about the comprehensive scope of the divine names, he writes, that led the angels to misjudge Adam. Implied in this discourse is the Sheikh's challenge to the transcendentalist mindset prevalent among the theologians of his day. Most Muslims, in truth, possess some awareness of God's imminence because of the personal nature of God's communication in the scripture and because of the intimacy they felt in worship. But the theologians emphasized God's incomparability and transcendence. They held that only the prophets had been able, had been capable of communing with God. Awe and the fear of God were stressed, and to obediently follow his commands. Ibn Arabi draws his readers' attention to a pattern in the Quran of alternating revelations about God's transcendence and imminence. There are verses that invite the intellect to ponder and conceptualize God's incomparability, while other verses engage the imagination with similes describing God's imminent presence around us and within us. The emphasis on God's transcendence by the theologians and many of the Sufis of his time, compelled the Sheikh to challenge their views, occasionally with strong language. In the wisdom of Noah, he writes, quote, For those who truly know the divine realities, the doctrine of transcendence imposes a restriction and a limitation on the reality For he who asserts that God is purely transcendent is either a fool or a rogue, even if he be a professed believer. For if he maintains that God is purely transcendent and excludes all other considerations, he acts mischievously and misrepresents the reality and all of the the apostles, albeit unwittingly. The truth is that The reality is manifest in every created being and in every concept, while he is at the same time hidden from all understanding, except for he who holds that the cosmos is his form and his identity. This is the name, the manifest while he is also unmanifested spirit, the unmanifest, unquote. The emphasis on God's transcendence had spiritual and psychological consequences. Mainstream believers were cautious, even fearful, of aspiring to any intimate communion with God. They imitated the sayings and behaviors of their religious leaders and carefully performed the established rituals of worship. Their religious personas struggled with instinct and imagination, both of which they regarded as Satan's playgrounds. Internalized transcendentalist teachings made people fearful of their own thoughts and feelings. They became judgmental of themselves and projected this onto others. Most of the mullahs rejected the possibility of intimately knowing God. So the believers' energies and emotions 
found their expression in religious conviction. More often than not, conviction led to absolutism with all of the hazards associated with insisting that there is only one truth. The Sheikh encouraged people to consider the many citations in the scripture about God's presence in the world and in themselves. At the very least, he hoped that people would regard what occurred in the world and in themselves as guiding signs from God. He wrote, quote, It is clear that God draws our attention to what is originated as an aid to knowledge of him and says that he will show forth his signs in it. Thus, God suggests that knowledge of him is inferred in knowledge of ourselves, unquote. The Sheikh is here quoting the Quran, which states, we will show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves until it is clear to them that he is the true reality. Repeating this verse in the wisdom of Noah, he adds an insightful statement about how our own experience is related to divine consciousness. Quote, For you are to God, just as your physical form is to you. And he is to you like the guiding spirit is to your corporeal form. For you are to God, just as your physical form is to you. And he is to you like the guiding spirit is to your corporeal form. I think a lot about this statement because it keeps me mindful of God's presence in my own experience. That whatever I experience, however trivial or profound, is always the embodiment of one or another of the divine names. The Sheikh's words beckon us to a path of intimacy, of seeking God within ourselves, in all of our changing states. This is the path that God invites us to with his words. He is with you wherever you are. To the extent that we can experience God's presence in our thoughts, feelings, fantasies, and sensations, we will witness the embrace of his qualities, however attenuated their manifestation might appear in our limited nature. In the wisdom of Abraham, Ibn Arabi states, quote, Do you not understand that the reality is manifest through the attributes of relative beings? When he has informed us of that himself, even through attributes of deficiency and blame, do you not understand that the created being is manifest through the attributes of the reality from the first to the last, all of them being appropriate to it, even as the attributes of created beings are appropriate to the reality. Unquote. Statements like this caused an uproar among the theologians. Many of them turned against Ibn Arabi and accused him of blasphemy. Even among those identifying themselves as Sufis, there were many who rejected all, if not portions, of the Sheikh's teachings about God's imminence. The religious doctrine of God's transcendence had its counterpart in the field of spirituality. Self-transcendence was practiced by Muslim mystics hoping to enter into God's presence. Abandoning the world, constant struggle with the ego self, and disengagement from the senses, these became the recommended practices. The Sufis of the period 
often stressed that it was only through self-denial and defacement that God could be known. Ibn Arabi certainly agreed with this view up to a point. He endorsed effacement and self-transcendence as the means of escaping ego identification in order to witness one's essential relationship to God. He taught that by dissociating from the senses and withdrawing from the ego self, the Gnostic could discover the unborn source of his or her own individuality. About such Gnostics, he writes in the Wisdom of Seth, quote, they have made themselves ever ready to receive whatever comes from God and have withdrawn completely from their separatist selves and their aims. Of these persons, there are those who know that God's knowledge of them in all of their states corresponds to what they themselves are in their state of preexistent latency. They know that the reality will bestow on them only that which their latent essences contribute to God. Unquote. Ibn Arabi wrote extensively about the self-transcendence known in Sufism as fana, the annihilation of the self. In most of Sufi literature, self-annihilation means to lose all awareness of oneself. Many writers have described fana as the objective of the spiritual path. Countering this view in the Mawaqe, the Sheikh writes, uh, William Chittick's translation, quote, true perfection is found only in the one who witnesses both his Lord and himself. If someone were to witness his Lord while being completely free of witnessing himself, as some people have claimed, he would gain no benefit and be the possessor of imperfection. For then the real would be the one who witnesses himself through himself, which is the way things are in any case. So what benefit would accrue to the one who supposes that he was annihilated from himself and witnessed his Lord at the same time? Unquote. The Sheikh generally associated self-transcendence with the disappearance of duality. Fana was for him the ultimate purification of the self, which would render it receptive to theophanies at the deepest level of personal awareness. He stated that genuine effacement should result in the enhancement of the mental and perceptive faculties. Quote, also from Chittick, there is no instance of witnessing without a trace in the one who witnesses it. The trace is what is called the witness. It brings about the increase that accrues to the rational and other faculties. If this witness is not found after the annihilation, then it was not an, an annihilation in Tawhid. On the contrary, it was a sleep of the heart, since in our view, annihilation is of two sorts. When we find the witness after it, then it is correct. When we do not find the witness after it, we call it a sleep of the heart. It is like someone who sleeps and does not dream." Unquote. Throughout his writings, the Sheikh described self-effacement as a prelude to the appearance of theophanies in the mirror of the heart. One of his finest explanations about the receptive scope of the mystic's heart is to be found in the wisdom of Shu'aib in the Fusus which is perhaps why this chapter became required reading in some Sufi circles. The Sheikh opens this chapter by quoting from God's statement that he is only embraced by the attuned and enabled 
human heart. The Hadith states, I am not embraced by my earth nor by my heavens, yet I am embraced by the heart of my servant, the faithful. The faithful, Al-Mumin, is one of several divine names which God has attributed both to himself and to human beings. The Arabic root for embracing or having capacity is wusa. Its numerology adds to 136, equivalent to that of mumin, faithful. This linkage helps us grasp God's stipulation that it is only his faithful servant, one with receptive capacity and attunement, who can embrace him. Just as God embraces his own image in the human mirror, the human being's core awareness, called the heart, has the capacity to embrace God according to the divine statement. The wisdom of Shu'aib explores this hadith as it applies to the whole range of human experience. The hadith is important enough to the sheikh that he ends the Fusus al-Hikam, the jewel of his legacy, by again quoting it. At the beginning of the Fusus, the sheikh makes a more general statement about God embracing his own qualities in the comprehensive human form. There he cites a tradition originating in the Jewish scripture that God created Adam according to his own image. Since the divine essence is deemed absolutely beyond formal manifestation, we may take it that these words refer to God's names and qualities. The wisdom of Shu'aib deserves careful, detailed study. Here I will just quote a few statements about the divine human embrace in its manifestation at different levels of transcendence and imminence. About the impossibility of our sense perceptions grasping God's absolute transcendence, Ibn Arabi writes, quote, On this question, Junaid said, when the contingent is linked with the eternal, there is nothing left of it. Thus, when the heart embraces the eternal one, how can it possibly be aware of what is contingent and created? Unquote. Here again, he points to self-effacement as a purification. In this case, of any consciousness of one's contingent mortal existence. The sheikh next describes how the heart is enabled to receive the theophanies of the divine names. He explains that the enabled heart necessarily conforms to the particular character of each divine self-manifestation. Quote, Since the self-manifestation of the reality is variable according to the variety of the forms, the heart is necessarily wide or restricted according to the form in which God manifests himself. The heart can comprise no more than the form in which the self-manifestation occurs. For the heart of the Gnostic, or the perfect man, is as the setting of the stone of the ring, conforming to it in every way." In the following lines, Ibn Arabi writes about the origins of these theophanies at the most obscure, transcendental level of divine manifestation prior to their appearance within the enabled heart, which is the interface bridging transcendence and imminence. Quote, God manifests himself in two ways, an unseen manifestation and a sensible witness manifestation. It is from the former type that the predisposition of the heart is bestowed being the essential self-manifestation, the very nature of which is to be unseen. When the predisposition comes to the heart, there is then manifested to it the sensible manifestation in the sensible world. 
so that it sees God manifest in the form in which he manifests himself to it, unquote. The Sheikh is being as clear as he can about the obscure transcendental origins of personal spiritual events and the manner in which they are experienced in the heart, the core of human awareness. Commentators on this chapter write that spiritual preparedness is bestowed on the heart at the level of the most sacred effusion, the Fayd al-Aqdas. This preparedness makes it possible for Gnostics to experience theophanies at the level of the sacred effusion, the Fayd al-Muqaddas. The divine names, which are mere potentials at the level of the most sacred effusion, manifest at the second level where they are experienced by the enabled heart. The Sheikh now switches the perspective to the human side where he describes the process of spiritual unfolding from the level of immanence. He quotes one of the most significant hadiths about Islamic spirituality, which states, quote, my servant persists in approaching me with an excess of devotion until I love him. When I love him, I become his hearing by which he hears, his seeing by which he sees, his tongue with which he speaks, his hand with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks." It is the servant's sincere expression of worship and devotion that is answered with God's infinite love. God reciprocates the servant's intense devotion with the intensification of his imminent presence in the servant's body and perceptive faculties. God's love saturates the servant's perceptive and sensory faculties, which are immeasurably enhanced by the divine awareness. In the following lines, the Sheikh describes the integration of transcendence and imminence. Quote, when you consider God's saying, I am his foot with which he walks, his hand with which he strikes, and his tongue with which he speaks, and all the other faculties and members in which they are situated, why do you make the distinction by saying it is all the reality or it is all created? It is all created in a certain sense, but it is also the reality in another sense, the essence being one. After all, in essence, the form of a self-manifestation and that of the one who perceives it are the same. For he is at once the self-manifesting subject and the object of that manifestation. Consider then how wonderful is God in his identity and in his relation to the cosmos in the realities inherent in his beautiful names. Unquote. Ibn Arabi adds this poem Who is here and what there? Who is here is what is there. He who is universal is particular. And he who is particular is universal. There is but one essence, the light of the essence being also darkness. He who heeds these words will not fall into confusion. In truth, only he knows what we say who is possessed of Hemma. Austin has translated the word Hemma as spiritual power, which it certainly means. Yet the Quran in the Surah Yusuf, for example, sometimes uses the verbal form of Hemma to mean loving and wanting. So in addition to the idea of power, spiritual power, we can take Hema to mean a loving and passionate resolve, which better fits the poem inspired by the hadith quoted by the Sheikh about knowing God through devotion and love. 
I am not embraced by my earth nor by my heavens, yet I am embraced by the heart of my servant, the faithful. This describes a heart <coughs> that embraces the levels of transcendence and imminence intrinsic to the divine names. God calls the heart faithful, meaning truly receptive to the divine realities. In the Quran, God tells the servant to bring him a sound heart, a healthy heart. Elsewhere, God describes the spiritual incapacity of those whose hearts are sick. In the verse, surely in that is a reminder for him who has a heart. It is implied that only a heart that is receptive to the divine reminders can truly be called a heart. In the ongoing discourse, in the wisdom of Shu'aib, the Sheikh extends the meaning of this verse to include the idea of the heart's adaptive receptivity. In the Quranic context, surely, and that is a reminder for him who has a heart, refers to God's destruction of past civilizations for their evil and rebellion. Yet the Sheikh often interprets the scripture in a much broader manner to support his insights. He writes, <clears throat> Surely in that is a reminder for him who has a heart by reason of God's transformation through all the varieties of forms and attributes. Unquote. The Sheikh explains <clears throat> that the enabled heart has undergone a fundamental transformation that keeps it adaptive to God's ever-changing self-manifestations. Through all its changing states and experiences, the heart remains conscious of God's presence in this world, and he claims also in the hereafter. Quote, <clears throat> for the Gnostic, the reality is known and not denied. Those who know in this world will know in the hereafter. For this reason, God says, for one who is possessed of a heart, namely one who understands the formal transformations of the reality by adapting himself formally so that from himself he knows the divine self, unquote. He continues, quote, God is the one who knows, the one who understands and affirms in this particular form, just as God is also the ignorant one, the uncomprehending, the unknown in that particular form. Unquote. According to the Sheikh, absolutism, dogmatism, and narrow mindedness are all undermined by the vastness of the heart's perspective. Conviction is dissolved in the direct experience of God's unity, which shines through the numerous veils of all of our states and forms. Except for this, he writes, people will remain trapped in their own projections and mental fabrications about themselves and true reality. In the wisdom of Hood, he writes, quote, <clears throat> In general, most men have perforce an individual concept of their Lord, which they ascribe to him and in which they seek him. So long as the reality is presented to them according to it, they recognize him and affirm him, whereas if presented in any other form, they deny him flee from him, and treat him improperly, while at the same time imagining that they are acting toward him fittingly. One who believes, believes only in a deity he has created in himself, since a deity in beliefs is a mental construction. They see in what they believe only themselves 
as relative beings and their own constructions within themselves, unquote. Perhaps most shocking to some and delightful to others of the Sheikh's discourses about God's imminence is save for the last chapter of the Fusus, the wisdom of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muhammad, according to Ibn Arabi, was the seal of prophecy because he embodied all of the divine names. The chapter is organized around a well-known hadith in which the prophet speaking to God says three things have been made beloved to me in your world, women and perfume, and the joy of my eyes is in the prayer. The hadith which bridges the levels of imminence and transcendence has clearly informed the sheikh's own comprehensive approach to spirituality. Women were made beloved to Muhammad, he explains, because the enlightened heart witnesses God most completely in the experience of sexual union. Quote, when man contemplates the reality in woman, he beholds God in a passive aspect, while when he contemplates God in himself as being that from which woman is manifest, he beholds him in an active aspect. When, however, he contemplates him only in himself, he beholds God as passive to the divine self directly. His contemplation of the reality in woman is the most complete and perfect because in this way he contemplates the reality in both the active and passive mode, while by contemplating the reality only in himself, he beholds God in a passive mode particularly. Unquote. As a shorthand for his spiritual path, the Sheikh would quote the famous saying of the prophets, peace be upon him, which reads, who, he who knows himself knows his Lord. Ibn Arabi's approach was always informed by the prophet's fusion of spiritual and worldly experience. The Sheikh emphasized the need to integrate the outer and the inner, the seen and the unseen, the transcendent and the imminent. He wrote that we can embrace God's imminent presence because we are ever in the embrace of the divine names. He taught that everything that exists is an embodiment of what is latent in the divine names and the essences of things. All entities are bodies, whether spiritual, imaginal, mental, or physical. It is by deepening our awareness of the different levels of embodiment that we can more fully witness the divine reality. The Sheikh's spiritual path can be put into practice at any time, in any situation, and in any state. For our hectic and complex world, it would be hard to find a more coherent approach. I think the Sheikh would have greatly appreciated the ideals of our modern pluralistic civilization. What we mean by pluralism at its best is the harmonious joining of a great many ways of life and points of view, an ethic at the heart of Ibn Arabi's teachings. I think he would have really appreciated the opportunities and hazards of our situation. Thank you.